Good day, dear students. Today we will talk about skull anatomy. So, the greatest Russian writer and poet, Alexander Pushkin, said, Our lives a dead preacher, is it full of wine or empty, for a sage as interlocutor, he stands head alive. The skull is the base of the head and the guardian of the mind. So, the skull bones are performing a protective function. Also, they take the structural framework for head organs and they take participation in the formation of sound. The knowledge of the structure of skull anatomy is important for therapeutists, for surgeons, neurosurgeons, dentists, traumatologists, ophthalmologists, otorhinolaryngologists and others. So why? Why the knowledge of the structures are so important? And next you see the abnormalities of skull. Now you see uh, the craniosthesis. You can see the fissure between the bones of the roof or calvaric skull, calvary crani. And you can see pathologic diseases uh, which uh, contains the brain and cover brains out of brain uh, place in the skull uh, cavity. Also you can see another abnormality, uh, abnormality uh, such as um, fissure lips um, and you can see two fissures of upper lip uh, uh, in Latin is labium liporinum abnormality and also you can see uh, fissure in tongue and fissure in palatum uh, this abnormal is called uh, palatum fissum in Latin or uh, lupus faucum is the same term for this abnormality and next you see uh, microcephaly and hydrocephalic syndromes. Um, uh, they are uh, very difficult diseases, uh, incurable diseases, and uh, a lot of children died with these, these abnormalities. And now you can see that the anatomy of skull bones is very important for doctors, therapeutists, pediatricians and others. So, what are the factors uh, which are affecting the anatomy of the skull? The skull adapts to the anatomy of the brain. Uh, and it serves the brain. So the skull adapts to the sensory organs like eyes, ears, uh, olfactory organ, tongue. Uh, within the skull before the skull itself, the sun's organs, organ of taste, hearing, smell and balance begin to form. The skull adapts to the senses, not vice versa. The skull serves as a support for initial section of respiratory and digestive organs. Parts are formed to ensure the functions of chewing and swallowing food as well as breathing. The complexity of the anatomy of skull is due to the fact that in the course of ontogenesis in humans, some stages of phylogenesis are briefly repeated. Therefore, at different stages of development, the human skull has different features, different details, which can be the cause of 
congenital defects and individual characteristics. Finally, human evolution was reflected in the anatomy of the skull. The visceral skull changed especially. It was tremendously influenced by the emergence of the speech function and the modification of the nutrition process. There was no longer the need of roof processing of food with teeth, which moreover sees it to be means of defense and attack. So, factors affecting the anatomy of skull. Uh, in chordates, the brain in its embryonic state is surrounded by a connective tissue shield, the membranous skull. Uh, membranous skull. Uh, fish have a protective shell around uh, the, the developing brain, mostly cartilaginous. So, which the exit to land for protection, the cartilaginous skull is replaced with a bone one. At the same time, the number of bones decreases and their structure becomes more complicated. Next, the cerebral section of the skull in progeny expanded in the caudal direction. This can be judged by the emergence of the cranial nerves. If in psychostomes the last nerves emerging from the skull are pairs 7 and 8, then the amphibian already has 10 pairs of cranial nerves. In mammals, the skull captures two more pairs of the total number of cranial nerves reaches 12. And you see that next step in evolution is separation of the head and trunk, the appearance of the neck in reptiles. The appearance of secondary bone, the appearance of a joint between the neck and the skull. Next, the appearance of the temporal mandibular joint. And the next part of evolution is separation of the nasal cavity from the oral cavity and form palatum, palatum between nasal and aural cavity. And also this is the change of the number of teeth to reduce the number of teeth and two generation. The human has two generation of teeth. Dentus decidui is the first generation and permanent dents, dentus or permanent teeth uh, is the second part of this um, teeth ontogenesis. Factor affecting the anatomy of the skull. <clears throat> Reflection of the evolution of human becoming. Next is bone pneumatization weight loss, thermal insulation of the organs of vision, smell and hearing, bone resonance. And now you see pneumatic cavities in maxilla, in frontal bone and uh, in ethmoid bones. So the human skull uh, has ne uh, the different features so the human cerebral part of skull is much larger in volume than the facial part. Along with the increase in the size of the cerebral section, in the anthropogenesis, its rounding occurred. The bones of the facial skull are smaller than those of animals. So, 
the mastoid processes are better developed. The bones of the facial skull are smaller than those of animals. I told you about this. And the relationship of mandible with the skull is sharply different. The cerebral skull is located above the facial skull. In animals behind the facial skull, the foramen magnum and candles are displaced anteriorly. The number of bones in the human skull is less than in other animals' tubers and ridges as less developed. Only a person, human person, has sinuses or cavities in skull bones with the development of speech blood, a speech function. So, next we will talk about skull development stages. The source of development of the bone tissue of the skull is a mesenchyme, is the embryo connective tissue, mesenchyme. At the same time, the cerebral and facial regions have independent embryonic development, also topographically, they are in close relationship. The skull goes through three stages in its development. You can see all the three stages. Membranose with connective tissue, cartilaginose with cartilaginous tissue and bony. The first two are temporary for mammals and humans. The membranose stage begins at the end of two weeks of embryogenesis. The primary bones begin to develop. In the region of the phonix, around the rapidly developing brain at the level of the hindbrain in accumulation of the mesenchymal cells, origin sclerotome is formed the secret collagen fibers, this corresponds to the membranous stage of skull development. The membranous skull, a leptocranium is in Latin, does not interfere with the development of the brain and even persists in the form of fentanylis and layers between the bones after birth. Already in the membranous skull, there are a number of holes and channels for the passage of nerves and blood vessels and in the future occipital bone, the occipital foramen. At 8-10 weeks of intrauterine development, ossification points appear in membranous centers. Bone tissue is formed, first formed by cars fibrous bone tissue. The bones or part of them involved in the formation of the base of the skull go through three A stages. At two four months of embryogenesis in the region of the base of the skull, around the developing sense organs, capsules of the olfactory, visual and auditory analyzers as well as around a pituitary gland hypophysis, cartilaginous cases are formed, the receptacles of the sense organs. During this period of the development of the skull, blood vessels and nerves grow into the cartilaginous base and future openings and canals are formed. As the development progresses, individual cartilages merge with each other. As a result, a solid cartilaginous plate with a median opening for the pituitary gland or hypophysis is formed at the base of the skull. As a result, in the second half of the third month, the skull has a cartilaginous base and the membranous valve. This state is called chondrocranium or cartilaginous skull. After this, the next stage of development begins. In the cartilage, a little later, 
then the membranose part of the skull, ossification points appear, and the cartilaginous tissue is replaced by bone. Osteocranium is the third stage. Osteocranium is formed a bony skull. At the time appropriate for the bone, ossification points appear. They gradually spread over the first surface and in depth forming the outer and inner plates of the compact substance and a spongy substance located between them. Uh, between the bones there are layers of cartilaginous tissue like synchrodrosis of the base of the skull, which connect the bones and injure their growth. Not all cartilaginous formation of the skull are ossified. A number of cartilage remains in adults, the cartilage of the wings of the nose, the cartilaginous part of the nasal septum, and the small cartilage of the base of the skull. The development of the facial skeleton must be compared with the development of the bones or aquatic animals. Uh, they retain the branchial apparatus throughout their leaves. The branchial arches are located metamerically between the branchial slits through which water passes, washing the gills, the respiratory organs. So, now you can see the bones that form from brain capsule. Of the basis of connective tissue, peritel bone, frontal bone, upper part of occipital squama, occipital bone, squama and tympanic part of the temporal bone. The bones developing are on the basis of cartilage, sphenoid bone, except for the medial plate of the pterygoid process. And you can see on this picture. Uh, number one, the bones which form from connective tissue. And part two are the bones development, uh, developing uh, from cartilaginous tissue. And also you can see the parts uh, of connective tissue on the roof bones, frontal bone, parate bone, occipital bone, Fonticles, fonticles, front fonticle and back fonticle. And now you see the cranial part, which name um, basis cranium, and you see the second stage of ontogenesis, uh, such as chondrocranial, and you see. Uh, cartilaginous models of um, basic cranial bones. And now you see the occipital bone and uh, cartilaginous parts of this bone between uh, squama, occipital, and between lateral parts and basic parts of this bone. You see the parts of cartilaginous tissue which may grow of this bone. And now also you can see the cartilaginous part of temporal bone between uh, squama part and uh, mastoid process. And also you can see cartilaginous tissue between uh, greater uh, ella uh, and body of this bone. So, bones development, developing in connection with the nasal capsule, based on connective tissue, uh, lacrimal bone, nasal bone, warmer, cartilage based, ethmoid bone, inferior nasal, concha. And you can see these bones. A lacrimal bone, nasal bones, a vomer, and also you can see cartilage-based bones, 
ethmoid bone and inferior nasal concha. Next, third group are bones development uh, from the gill arch. Immovable skull bones, maxilla, plantine bone, zygomatic bone, movable skull bones, mandible, hyoid bone, auditory ossicles. And you may see the bones on their pictures, uh, bones development. Uh, you can see maxilla, palatine bone, zygomatic bone, and also you can see mandible, hyoid bone, auditory ossicles. So, the development of the facial skull from arches. Uh, in the human embryo, in accordance with the law of embryonic similarity, at the beginning of the formation of anterior part of the digestive tract, where the branchial apparatus also begins to appear, in human begins to form five branchial, branchial arches formed by the mesenchyme. They are called visceral. visceral. Uh, the fifth is rapidly reduced. And between them there are five pairs of branchial pockets. Instead of the gill slits, they are simply deepenings. Uh, in the branchial arch, cartilaginous plates are formed on the basis of the first two the visceral scalp develops. Uh, the first visceral arch uh, is uh, the um, part of which development uh, maxilla and mandible bones, palatine bone, zygomatic bones, medial plate of the pterygoid process, osphenoid bone and nasal bones. And from second visceral arch are developed stapes. Uh, it's one of auditory ossicles, small parts of hyoid bone, styroid process of the temporal bone. And the third visceral arch um, gives um, develop, development for body and large horns of hyoid bone and for other uh, auditory ossicles. So, uh, next we will talk about skull bones. You must know uh, that there are two parts of skull bones anatomy. Uh, first group of bones are cerebral skull bones and second group is uh, facial or visceral skull bones. And uh, first we will talk about uh, cerebral skull bones. They are occipital bone, you may see it uh, on 14 number. Parietal bone, uh, number two. Frontal bone, number one. Temporal bone, number 13. Sphenoid bone, uh, there is number three. And ethmoid bone, in number 12. And also, you can see the visceral skull bones, they are maxilla number six and zygomatic bone number five, palatine bone uh, there is no this bone on this picture. I show I'll show it later. Nasal bone number four, lacrimal bone 
number for this page uh, in blue color so another bone is number 11 here you can see and uh, inferior nasal concha you can see it uh, here uh, it's number 9 <coughs> mandible or jaw and woman it's number 8 so next we will talk about the section of cerebral skull uh, you see uh, the calvaria of the skull or roof of the skull and we uh, talk that there are two parts of the skull cerebral and facial parts and uh, the cerebral section is receptacle of the brain and some sense organs and its volume is over 1500 cubic centimeters it distinguishes between the arch a roof or calvaria you may see calvaria here and the base or basis of cranium so the bones of the skull are distinguished by a number of features in the bones of cerebral section you may see them here which make up the cranial vault the outer and inner lamina of a compact substance are distinguished as a spongy substance located between them it's named diploe it's named diploe so the spongy substance is penetrated by the channels containing diploic veins the inner lamina is thin contains little organic matter and is fragile with injuries here, here fracture, fractures occurs much more often than external the outer plate is covered with the periosteum or pericranium the periosteum in the area of the sutures grows together tightly and for the rest of the land it connects loosely with the bones and limits the subperiosteal cellular space within one bone in this space the occurrence of hematomas and abscesses is possible for the inner lamina the periosteum is the dura matter of the brain the inner surface of the bones of the cerebral skull has depressions and elevation corresponding to the convolutions and grooves of the brain branched grooves are traces of adherence to the bones of the skull of arterial vessels and venous systems venous sinuses um, of the dura matter of the brain the grooves for the passage of the arteries are narrow tree-like branching usually located closer to the lateral sides of the base of the skull the venous grooves are white flat more pronounced in the posterior region in some places the skull has emissaria like this pareto emissary house uh, there are holes for veins to pass to the first surface of the skull and so you may see the outer grooves and also you can see the skull depressions and elevations corresponding convolutions and grooves of the brain and this is important part of knowledge about skull because there are a lot of damages of arterial blood uh, uh, vessels and uh, you may see on the right picture 
uh, hematoma, hematoma of uh, brain, uh, and uh, this human was died. So next uh, we will talk about uh, basis part of skull. Uh, uh, this this part. Uh, development from cartilaginous uh, skull uh, and I told you that the bones of the basic part of skull uh, are development from cartilaginous models uh, and uh, you can see uh, two parts of base uh, the internal part and you may see three uh, fossa, fossa crani anterior. It's uh, uh, it's uh, anterior fossa, fossa crani medium, intermediate fossa, and fossa crani posterior. It's back fossa, in internal base. And also you can see two parts of external part of the basic crane. Uh, the anterior part, uh, which covered with the facial bones, and posterior part without covered with any bones. So, uh, why, why the knowledge about bones of the skull are so uh, important for doctors? And first, I want to tell you about fracture of the base skull and you can see the symptom of cranial uh, fracture uh, is traumatic glasses uh, surround the eyes so um, on lateral surface you must know uh, three uh, forces uh, temporal fossa and uh, the part of squama temporale is very thin. There is no sponge substance between two um, uh, lamina, and uh, this part is very fragile, and there are a lot of trauma on this part, um, and you can see the fracture of temporal bone and uh, hematoma because the artery uh, which uh, mm, which um, situated here um, is was damaged so on the lateral surface you can see two fossas first is infront temporal fossa and next inner is pterygopalatin fossa. They are important because uh, there are a lot of vessels and nerves uh, are situated here and you must know about their forces um, and more detailedly we will talk about them on practical classes. So uh, <clears throat> also you can see zygomatic arch on um, lateral surface and uh, there are um, a lot of fractures of this part of skull uh, who like box or fighting and you can see the fracture on this man. Next we will talk about uh, part of skull which call orbita or uh, orbit and you can see uh, this fossa for eye bulb and you may see it here and um, if we have the abnormality of the eye bulb uh, then the deformation uh, was diagnosed and 
you may see the pathologic uh, process of eye bulb uh, neoplasma and if uh, we will see this abnormality you also can see the abnormal uh, structures of orbit um, and you may see deformation of skull uh, because this is abnormal uh, ontogenesis of eye bulb. Next we will talk about nasal cavity. There are two parts of this uh, scale part uh, olfactory area because it contains olfactory receptor and next is respiratory area because the air uh, goes here uh, with inspiration and expiration processes. And so uh, you can see uh, the nasal cavity lateral well uh, or lateral uh, parius, it's in Latin, uh, upper wall and lower low wall, uh, it's the septum between uh, nasal cavity and aural cavity. Next we'll talk about nasal septum, it's uh, uh, the septum part of nasal cavity and it contains with uh, also part or bones part uh, which made uh, with uh, um, etmoid bone and uh, warmer bone and also you can see the cartilaginous part of nasal septum uh, is cartilago septinase and also you can see it here on the frontal section and you may see uh, it uh, in operation um, on septal, uh, septal part of nasal cavity. Heart palate is a uh, septal part between oral and uh, nasal cavity. Um, it contains from two parts. The uh, palatine process of maxilla uh, on the front part and on the back part there are two uh, flats uh, of palatine bones there are right and left uh, uh, horizontal plates horizontal laminas uh, of palatine bones and also you can see the abnormalities uh, of the heart palate is uh, one of these uh, is palatal torus and uh, cleft palate uh, I told about this or uh, palate fissure um, its name is in Latin palatum fissum or lupus falsum next we will talk about mandible uh, you can see uh, the mandible of adult person with teeth, with alveolus, with angles uh, of mandible and also you can see the mandible of newborn child and the mandible of senile um, grandmother or grandfather. Uh, so, uh, next we will talk about uh, age features. So, uh, when the child is born, his skull bears little resemblance to that of an adult. The proportions differ sharply from those of an adult. The cerebral section is eight times larger than the facial one. In adult, due to the full development of the masticatory apparatus, 
the cerebral section is only two times larger than the facial one. The tubercles of the frontal and parietal bones are well expressed, therefore, when reviewed as and viewed from above. The skull appears square. Square. The frontal bone consists of two halves. The superficially arch are absent. The frontal sinuses are not yet present. The mandible consists of two halves. The jaw is underdeveloped. Since there are no teeth, the angle between the body and ramus of mandible is the greatest about 150 degrees. Parts of the temporal bone are separated from each other by well-defined slits containing cartilaginous layers. The mastoid process is not, is not developed. Due to the poor development of the muscles on the bones of the skull, muscle tubercles and lines are not expressed. The paranasal sinuses are not developed. The foramen magnum is directed somewhat backward. The auditory tube is short and wide. The most characteristic feature is that the skull of the newborn bears traces of the all three stages of development. In the area of the roof, there are large areas of connective tissue, as a result of which the skull is elastic. This feature facilitates the adaptation of the petal head to pass through the fibrous ring of the small pelvis of a woman during the ch childbirth when the edges of the parietal bones overlap in the midline as well as squama of the frontal and occipital bones on the parietal bones. In a newborn, the skull has fontanelles, fonticuli it's in Latin, non ossified connective tissue areas, uh, outside covered with skin and sacrocranial aponeurosis. From the side of the cranial cavity, the dura matter is adjacent to them. In the region of the fontanelles, pulsation of the arteries of the brain and membranes is felt in connection with which these areas are called pulsating. The magnitude and size of the fontanelles are subject to significant fluctuations. By the time of their closure, you, one can judge the mineral metabolism and aces the physician physical development of the child. A newborn has six fontanelles. The largest is the frontal or anterior, has a rhomboid shape, is located between the two parts of the frontal bone and both parietal bones. Overgrew at uh, two years of age. This is perhaps the only fontanelle of importance for practical medicine. It has a certain pulsation, the tension of which depends on intracranial pressure. It can sink a bulge. When listening to the fontanelle, a blowing noise is hard, synchronous with the pulse. It is listening to internal carotid artery in the temporal bone canal. In the case of violation of the outflow of cerebral spinal fluid, the skull increases in size. And I saw that picture uh, hydrocephalic uh, abnormal, abnormality. And posterior occipital uh, fontanel is triangular overgrow at the second month of the life. Lateral frontalis are paired 
sphenoid and mastoid, these fentanyls outgrew at the last month of fetal development and are found only in premature babies. Late closure of the fentanyls indicate violations either hydrocephalus or rickets. In addition to these six permanent fentanyls, non-permanent ones can occur in newborns. Cerebellar at the posterior edge of fermion magnum, nasofrontalis between the nasal and two halves of the frontal bone, medial frontal in the midline of the frontal bone, sagittal uh, along the sagittal suture, uh, irregular frontalis can be the site of cranial hernias, which the protrusions of the contents of the skull under the skin. Without surgery, such hernias are fatal. You can see uh, skull shapes. I want to tell you some words about skull development and uh, uh, at first year of life the volume of brain increases and the cerebral skull grows strongly. The thickness of the skull bones increase by about three times. The outer and inner plates are formed in the bones of the world and uh, for two years changed in the facial skull occur mainly due to the eruption of teeth. They become higher than the jaw. Facial expressions are erect. The load on the chewing muscles also increase. This leads to thickening and mobilization of the bone plates. They can move aside air cavities begin to form. Ridges, tuberosities and ridges become larger and larger. By the age of seven years old, the fusion of the frontal bones and, and etmoid parts grow together. From seven to 18 years old, the cerebral skull slowly and harmoniously grows, and the facial the opposite. Teeth change their number and size. The dental arch are enlarged. This is the second impetus of the development of the chewing muscles. The general development of the child <clears throat> stimulates the development of facial muscles. The angle of mandible is already visible. The external nose takes a constant configuration and increase. By the age of 13, the scrumum mastoid suture is overgrown. Poverty. 13, 14 till 70, 80 years old. Change in both the cerebral and facial skull occur softly and harmoniously. In the cerebral skull, the frontal part expands and de deepens. The formation of the constant volume is completed. The air synesthetes are formed. By the age of 20, the seams between the sphenoid and occipital bones are sphy. It should be noted that premature sutures closer leads to microcephaly. The brain is small and mental development is impaired. On the other hand, there are cases of preservation of sutures until old age. So on the skull of German philosopher Kant, who died at the age of 18, all sutures were open. So uh, next we will talk about skull asymmetry and skull uh, shapes, but first I want to tell about sinew skull 
uh, uh, and uh, that feature is of Sinel scan. So, our growing of the sutures between the cranial bones. It begins with the sagittal suture, then spreads along the coronal and lambdalid. Our growth of the sutures occurs in different people at different times, and there are no remember the so-called bone age, which often do, does not coincide with the passport age. Senior skull is characterized by loss of bone substance, especially cancellous osteoporosis occurs, bones become lighter and thinner, additional holes appear on some thin bones. Due to the weakening of the muscles, the relief of the skull is smoothed. And finally, the teeth fall out, the alveolar processes of jaws are erased, they decrease inside like this. Uh, as a result, the shape of the facial skull change. It becomes from oblong as at an early age round. In general, the skull is designed in such a way that a system of beams is formed in it, which converge to the body of sphenoid bone. In the depressions of the cranial fossa, there are weak spots where fractures are mainly localized. Here the bones have the smallest thickness. So next uh, we will talk about skull shapes. An accurate measurement of the bones that make up the skull shows that there is no perfect symmetry. Usually, 97% um, the right half is slightly more developed than the left. Also, on the right side, ridge and rugless are more developed. Violation or harmonious growth leads to deformation. Premature overgrowth of the sagittal suture uh, usually leads to the fact that the expansion of the skull in white is difficult and limited. In this case, the activity of the kernel and lambdate sutures continues to the skull growth in the longitudinal direction. The result is a deformity called scaphocephaly. I will show you later scaphocephaly. And the cranial skull is long and narrow. With the tower skull, the coronary and lambdoid sutures are prematurely closed. I will show that abnormal too, too but later. The cranial skull becomes elongated upward and slightly backward. The causes premature suture close is unknown. Perhaps it is hormonal in nature. In addition to natural deformation of the skull, which are due to unclear reasons, there are artificial deformation. You may see it on this picture. Uh, some trips of the wild Indians of South America had a strange custom of the artificially stretching the skull, giving them the tower shape, um, a flatten it with the planks or specially tied up. In some places a double topped skull was preferred. Some wild island stripes <coughs> still tie the soft head <coughs> of the newborn with the cord from the net. Uh, the flattened forehead therefore moves back, which clearly distinguishes, according to the views of the islanders, uh, a person from an animal. In France, uh, you can see on this picture, uh, the, uh, in Toulouse, a head extended towards the back of the head was considered beautiful for a girl. <laughs> This was also achieved by transverse bandaging in childhood. Uh, as a result, the so-called too loose head, too loose head. 
and uh, mm, something similar can be found in Central Asia. The crown of the head is the same size for skull cap by bandaging. So, uh, next we will talk about areas of Stratman. Strengthen uh, structures uh, of the skull. In some places <clears throat> of the skull, there are bony thickenings of, or areas of the skull that straighten its structure through which the chewing pressure is transmitted to the cranial vault. Between them, there are thinner bone formations called weak points. Fractures are more common in these areas. There are four such areas on the maxilla. Frontal nasal area, you may see it here, rests below of the alveolar eminences in the canine area. Uh, at the top, it continues in the form of a reinforced plate of the frontal process of the maxilla, reaching the nasal part of the frontal bone. Next, alveolar zygomatic area. Uh, it's here. Uh, goes from alveolar eminence of one and second molars goes up the zygomatic ridge to zygomatic bone, which redistributes pressure posteriorly to the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Next, pterygo or sphenopalatine area. It's here. Uh, starts from alveolar eminence of the molars and tuber maxilla. It goes up where it's reinforced by the pterygoid forces of the phenolic bone and perpendicular plate to the palatine bone. The palatine area, you may see it here, uh, is formed by the palatine process of the maxilla to the horizontal plates of the palatine, palatine bone connected uh, the right and left alveolar arch in the transfer direction. It balances the force in lateral direction during chewing. Two areas are distinguished to on the mandible, and you may see it here. Alveolar area goes up to alveolar cells, and a standing area uh, goes up the branch of the mandible to the neck <coughs> uh, and to the head. From here, chewing pressures are transmitted to the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. Next, we'll talk about craniometry and some uh, points of craniometry methods. Uh, you can see uh, the main points, and so uh, first I want to tell that human skulls vary in size and value. It can be very important to know these dimensions. For this there is a method called craniometry. In the anthropometric study of the head, the cranial indicator is often used. It's calculated after measuring the transverse diameter, distance between the two parietal tubers and anteroposterior distance from calabula to the outer occipital tuber. So, uh, you may see the main chromatic points here. Uh, and you may see it here on this picture and also you can see the dimensions 
between chronometric points. Uh, you can see there on this picture uh, first distance the maximum white of the skull, second the smallest white of the forehead, third is distance between the inner corners of the eyes, fourth zygomatic whites, face whites, fifth is the white of the nose, and sixth is the white of mandible. And also you can see uh, the points of a uh, skull. Trichium, um, Epical, uh, Ganion, Glabella, Nesion, and Tregion. So you may see uh, dimensions of the lateral part of the head, and also you can see the main points. Uh, number one is the line passing through the tragus point and the lower edge of the orbit. The second is the greatest length of the head longitudinal distance. The third is uh, head height. Uh, fifth is ear wide. Sixth is nose height. Seven is the height of the middle part of the face. Eighth is the morphological height of the face. And nine is physiognomic height of the face. And also you can see the main skull shapes, ellipsoidal shape, and uh, also you can see uh, the di distances are longitudinal and transverse distances of the skull. And uh, ellipsoidal shape uh, skull uh, has uh, the bigger uh, longitudinal uh, distance um, and shorter uh, transverse distance. Also, you can see a void uh, like egg form shape, uh, pentagonoid shape uh, like pentagonus, uh, spheroid shape skull, and sphenoid shape skull. Uh, five forms. So, uh, also, yeah, also, I want to say that um, the uh, main parameter of craniometry is uh, calculation after measuring uh, the transfers distance between two parietal tubers and anteroposterior distance from glabella to the, outer, to the outer occipital tuber. Uh, so uh, if uh, index uh, between transverse dimension and anteroposterior size is uh, above um, 80 persons uh, that um, this cranium, this skull has brachiocephalic shape. If this index is between 76 to 79 percent, uh, this is mesocephalic shape skull. And if this index um, indicator is below 75%, this is dolichocephalic shape uh, skull, 
long-headed skull. Uh, so uh, next I show you some abnormalities. You know, uh, you know, uh, craniosthesis here. So next you can see scapha cephali. Uh, you know that um, uh, this is uh, dolichocephalicus uh, cranium skull, um, where um, indicator is below 75. Um, it's a resulting of um, measuring between transverse dimension and longitudinal dimension. The transfer dimension is uh, more uh, lesser than longitudinal dimension. And the cranium has skull shape, uh, scaphoid shape. Acrocephalic um, skull, you may see it here. Uh, this skull is uh, brachiocephalic shape form, um, short headed skull, and kernel index is above uh, 80, maybe 85 percent. Next, plagiocephalic, you may see uh, the earliest uh, uh, closed sutures from one side is asymmetric skull. Uh, and he it it has a flat uh, surface. Meningocele, you saw it on the first part of my lecture. It's uh, cranial schizis, uh, and uh, also you can see another abnormality, uh, microcephaly, um, on which all the sutures. Uh, finished to grow because they are closed and all the connective tissue between these bones uh, become bones tissue. Uh, also you can see uh, Twitcher Collins uh, syndrome with uh, face bones deformations, uh, orbital deformations, um, mandible deformation and uh, ears deformation. Also, you can see the Pierre Robin syndrome uh, is the absence of uh, mandible, and you can see uh, it on this picture. And also, you can see uh, Golden Heart syndrome on this baby. Uh, this is asymmetric mandible. Uh, grow, uh, normal growth from one side and uh, abnormal grow uh, on the uh, pathologic side. Goldengar syndrome uh, or hemifacial microsomia. Okay, we will we finish our lecture. Thank you for attention and on the uh, on this picture you can see uh, skulls in first uh, time, but if you uh, will see these pictures attentively, you may see uh, the life in uh, Europe uh, in Renaissance uh, time. You may see uh, the sense of the life in Europe in Renaissance time. Okay, we finish. Thank you for your attention. See you again next time. Bye-bye.